What's up everybody, this is Ryan here, and in a moment we're going to crack into a live lecture which I did on coroutines, which was part of my live stream Q&A every Sunday, so do consider stopping by if you uh, would like to ask me questions about Android and coroutines and stuff like that. Anyways, I just wanted to mention before we go into this video that basically what you're going to be watching is a rough first draft presentation uh, on coroutines, but hopefully by taking you through some of the source code and talking about it in the simplest language I could talk about it to you in, and then in part two looking at some actual practical code examples, hopefully you'll start to see not just how coroutines kind of work, what, what causes the magic behind them, but also how to actually use them in your applications. So in part two of this lecture, which will be a separate video, I'll actually show you an example of actually using them in an Android application that happens to be model view view model. So anyway, like I say, the following footage was recorded live, so I didn't have time to pause or things like that, so just kind of bear with me. And in the future, I will definitely release a way more polished version of this tutorial and talk uh, soon enough. So thank you so much for watching. If you do find the video useful, then uh, or if you learned something, do consider hitting the like button down below. And here we go. Okay, so here we go. So how do how are we gonna do this? What, what's what's going on? I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm talking about here. Okay, so let's talk about coroutines on Kotlin. So before I get to like the actual lesson part, why why should you care about Kotlin coroutines? So uh, I've been programming in Java uh, for well over yeah you know, over four or five years at this point. And I've been coding in Kotlin for about a year and a half. And uh, I've been, of course, most of my time is spent on Android. So when I was working with Java and Android, I ran into this library, which became super popular, called RxJava. And RxJava was basically, the way I like to describe it, was like the observer pattern on steroids. If that doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. You don't need to understand that. But these topics are kind of related. And so in, in a nutshell, what exactly is the observer pattern? It's a situation where either different objects or even different functions can basically communicate with each other without having to, uh, by knowing about each other in sort of an indirect way. And that's one of the themes that we're gonna see popping up with coroutines. Why do we use it though? We basically use it when we have a situation where instead of our program being able to just run line by line sequentially through all of the instructions of a program, oftentimes we have situations where the execution of the program isn't line by line it or uh, one after another in terms of like time. It's indeterminate or asynchronous. So this is kind of the main point with uh, coroutines here is asynchrony or asynchronous programming or concurrency, you might have heard the word. Um, we have a computer and it's capable of dividing workload, execution of code into separate threads, separate processes, separate coroutines. For example, it can divide things and these different things can do their work at the same time and then call back at an indeterminate time. So this is kind of one of the core problems that Coroutines looks to solve. And what I'll do is now we'll start to get into some of the specifics of Coroutines. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, and so right off the bat, this is one part of this talk that I'm really not happy with uh, without good visual diagrams. So the next best thing I can do for you is I can take you through some of the actual source code of Coroutines and I can kind of point to some general things on the whiteboard here which might help you but in the future I expect a much more polished uh, presentation in that regard. So conceptually what is a coroutine? So what I wanted to start people off with was I'm, I'm gonna go all like WWE style holding the microphone here. <laughs> okay so conceptually speaking what is it what exactly is a it is a coroutine? So in terms of if we want to, let's just play word games for a little bit, because at first I was wondering, what does this word coroutine actually mean? 
So one of the ways we can think about this is uh, basically if I were to pick a different name, and I'm not saying you should use this name for a coroutine, it's like a cooperating function. So it, it's just a function, but somehow it's able to cooperate with other functions. Coroutine, cofunction. So when I say that to you, that doesn't really help you that much. It probably just gives you more questions than answers. In fact, the key question that that will probably give you is, um, how can it communicate with other functions? How does that work? Are we talking about maybe inter-thread communication, inter-process communication? Not exactly. We can do threading with coroutines, but it's something a little bit different with that. And in order, in order to actually explain this, what I'll have to do is I'll have to show you some of the source code and kind of go through it with you. Okay, so the first theme we're going to look at here is that um, we're going to look at some of the different properties of a coroutine, but the first thing we're going to do code-wise is we're just going to have a look at a quick example. Okay, so this is just something I wrote in a Kotlin Android Studio project. It's this uh, class here called Coroutines Demo. All it has is a suspending function, which is just a normal function, just a normal function, nothing fancy going on, and then we slap on the suspend modifier. Ooh, spooky, magical. What does this actually do? Well, what we're going to do, so one of the nifty features, and this is seriously one of the best ways to learn Kotlin, is in Android Studio, you can go up to, is it, uh, tools, here we go, I momentarily forgot. And in the tools window, depending on what version of Android Studio you're working with, there is this Kotlin option down here. And then at the bottom, we have show Kotlin bytecode. So I've already clicked that. And on the side here, we have this Kotlin bytecode window. Now, I'm, you know, I'm familiar with the very basics of reading bytecode, but uh, we're, we're not going to do that. What we're actually going to do is we're going to hit this decompile button here. And so this is actually going to basically show you what happens. So I forgot to add the suspend keyword. That would have been silly. So, so we've got our Kotlin code, and then we see what it looks like when it's converted to JVM sort of byte code. And then we can like sort of decompile, reverse that process back into Java. Now, the reason why this helps us a lot of times is that we actually kind of get to see what's going on under the hood at least on the J JVM, so this whole talk is talking about coroutines on the JVM, just so you're aware, um, we can actually kind of see what's going on. So this thing doesn't look like it's updated properly, so let, let me just see, there we go. So I'm gonna hit decompile, and that's what I'm looking for. Okay, so as I just mentioned, so we've got just some stupid old function that doesn't do anything. Then we slap on this suspend keyword, and what does that actually do? How do we actually create a coroutine out of this? All that suspend keyword does is it adds this continuation object, a continuation. Let me go ahead and just delete that, and then we'll decompile it again. And notice that basically all that's happened is we no longer have a continuation object. So this is kind of the first entry point that we need to get into because this is really important. So earlier I said that coroutines are like functions that can cooperate together, cooperating functions, co-functions. And a couple of specific points here. Is that they can be nested Coroutines can be nested, they can be suspended, they can be canceled, and they can be threaded if you want. And all of this is made possible just by adding this continuation object. So what the hell is a continuation? So this is where we'll jump to next. So what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna look at the actual source code for Kotlin coroutines. So this repository is called kotlinx.coroutines and you can check it out. I basically just cloned it. 
Okay, so let me just find my place in my notes. And so the first thing I want to do is I want to look at this continuation object. So just bear in mind when we added the suspending keyword to our stupid little function here, it added a continuation object to that function and it didn't actually really do much other than that. Just added the continuation. So what's a continuation? Random messages from Android Studio. So this is what the continuation object looks like as an interface. So all I want you to pay attention to is it has this resume function. So when we want to figure out a class, what it is, when we want to figure out what a class is, my tip to you is to look at the source code and ask yourself two questions. What does it have? What objects does it possess? And what does it do? What functions does it have? And the really the thing that's jumping out here is we have this resume with. So we're creating a function and we're giving it a continuation object and this continuation object can resume operations. So it can be paused and it can resume. So that's one of the key points here about why we're using this word suspend in when we're talking about coroutines. It's a function that can suspend and this continuation object is basically the main way that it does that. It can be suspended. That's useful. This is basically like a callback. Okay, so that's relatively simple and I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail. This is just like a generic result wrapper and we, we don't want to actually take this particular uh, thing seriously because it's actually kind of a stub. <laughs> But this will give you a general idea of this continuation object. Now, this part is simple. So we have a continuation object, and what it does is it's, it, it can resume. What does it have? And this is where things get complicated, so I'm just going to let the, the beginners know in particular. If you don't understand what the hell I'm talking about um, in detail, that's totally okay, because this there's a lot of moving parts going on here. So now we have, our, we have a coroutine context object. Okay, so let's have a look at coroutine context. So whenever we're talking about coroutines, we're basically also talking about something called a coroutine context. So we won't go into a ton of detail about this particular thing, but the, the, the thing that I do want you to know about coroutine context, and this is the important detail here, is that it's basically um, it's it's an indexed set of element in instances. It's like a uh, mix between a set and a map. To simplify things, let's just consider that coroutine context is like a map. So when I say map, I mean like the hopefully you're familiar with the map API from collections in Kotlin and Java. So a map is full of elements and you can find each element in the map with a key. So we've got key value type stuff going on. Uh, put things in with a, a key to find it and then the data and that's kind of hopefully you know how a map works. Okay, so this thing is basically a map. Now what I wanted to, let me just make sure I'm not jumping around here. So what I wanted to point out here. So I said this is where the magic happens. So so what exactly is magical, magical about this coroutine context? So let's look at what the actual elements. So here we just see like pretty generic kind of functions to add things to a map type stuff going on. But the thing I want you to pay attention to is we have this interface down here, element. And we use this a lot in coroutine context. Now, wait a minute. Element extends coroutine context. Wait a minute. So we have a map which is capable of nesting other maps inside of themselves. So again, just to, to reiterate here, earlier I said that coroutines can be nested. That's interesting. That's actually pretty magical. 
so the next thing I wanted to mention, so uh, the, the takeaway here is just understand that we have this nesting behavior that can be achieved with coroutines, and we'll see an example of that shortly. And part of how it achieves that is through this coroutine context object being a map, which can possess other coroutine contexts. Okay, that's probably whatever, lots of jargon there. What else can a coroutine context contain? Several different things, but again, one of the things I mentioned up on the whiteboard, coroutines can be cancelled. How do we cancel a coroutine? Well, what we can do is we have another thing called a job. I don't have a job personally, but uh, this API has a job. <laughs> Um, we have this job interface, and lo and behold, what does it extend? Coroutine context dot element. We can add a job to a coroutine context. So the important takeaway here for this job is is that it has several different states. So it's a, a way of like maintaining information about what's going on in a particular coroutine context or particular coroutine in general, but it also can be cancelled. And this is where we get our cancellation functionality, and we'll see that in an example later. So that's kind of the, the general anatomy of a coroutine, leaving out coroutine scope, which we'll look at in a minute. So the, the purpose in explaining that is that um, just to reiterate what I just went over. So when we want to think about what a, a coroutine is conceptually, it can be really difficult because we'll hear people say things like a coroutine is a function that can be nested, suspended, cancelled, threaded, even if you want to, and we'll see threading in a minute as well. It's just a function with these extra things. And what that really means is that starting with what I showed you right in the beginning, it all starts with just adding this suspend keyword to some function. That kind of basically turns it into like a cooperating function or a coroutine. And how does it actually do the cooperation? How does it actually do the suspending? How does it wait for some other thing to happen? How does it uh, cancel? How do you nest coroutines within each other? We had the suspend keyword as one example. That gives us this continuation object. Okay, cool. Continuation looks like this. It can resume. So this is where we get kind of our suspending behavior. And then it also has a coroutine context. Then if we jump into coroutine context, it's basically like a map. And it the elements of this coroutine context uh, actually extend coroutine context so that we can actually nest these maps into each other. And that's kind of another layer of cooperation that we get. And then there's more things going on. There's jobs, there's, there's scopes, um, that kind of stuff, dispatchers. There's a lot of topics going on here. But then we get this job object, which extends coroutine context element. And you can add that into a coroutine context.